Welcome back to our continuing series for the National Cancer Prevention Workshop produced by Less Cancer. This year, we're focusing on cancer prevention in rural America, screenings and healthcare for better outcomes. I'm Miles O'Brien. I'm a board member of Less Cancer, and we are talking to thought leaders in this space. And uh, our next guest is going to help us understand how distance is a disparity. She is the Chief Scientific Officer and Executive Director of Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City. Nelly Ulrich, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me today. I'm really delighted to talk to you about this. So we've been talking about rural populations. Uh, you have what you call frontier populations. Walk us through that. You're in a part of the world uh, where population density is quite sparse, and that it complicates matters, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely, it does. And so just to set the stage, um, Huntsman Cancer Institute is located in Utah, but we serve actually five states in the Mountain West, including Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada, and of course, Utah. And many of those states are really having many dispersed populations, including uh, frontier populations, Montana and Wyoming are examples of that. And what does that mean? I mean, let me start out first by talking about patient care briefly. So a uh, distance can be a disparity. For example, if one of our patients has to come here for radiation treatment, they come repeatedly, but often they have to go over mountain passes, they have to drive many, many hours, and they do that while they have side effects such as diarrhea. And that is very, very challenging for them. And so we're looking to figure out how can we improve both prevention and care as we serve these vast areas in the Mountain West. Well, so just as a definition, what would you call uh, frontier and how does that compare on um, population density to what we would ca classify as rural? Yes, so rural is typically classified as fewer than 100 people per square mile and frontier is fewer than seven people per square mile. So it's a lot of nothingness and it means like for, uh, for every activity that you're, you're doing, whether it's going shopping or whether going to school, there's transport involved. And for healthcare, of course, there's distance that has to over, be overcome. And the distances can be quite daunting. As you say, not just the mountain passes, but just the outright numbers are, are daunting as well, right? Yes, many of our patients travel more than 500 miles to come here. And what is also interesting, you think, oh, you could just take a plane. With some diseases like some leukemias, you're not able to take a plane, you have to drive. And you can imagine that distance is already a challenge. But when the weather is bad and there's a snowstorm, many of those freeways are not even getting cleared. So we really try to facilitate everything for our patients when they come here to, to have um, everything like a one-stop shop. And, and of course we use different ways to then continue their cares at their home. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the population, who, you know, what your demographics here. I imagine, especially in your part of the world and when you're talking about frontier populations, probably a fair number of Native Americans, but give us a sense of who you see that live in these uh, sparsely populated areas. Yes, absolutely. We have, uh, of course, many rural white individuals, but we also have a large Hispanic population and we have 43 um, tribes and nations who we serve. And we have specific programs to reach out to them and work with them. We have a special populations program that is focused on Native Americans. What other complications uh, come up uh, when, when there's such uh, an amount of distance? Is it um, as you say, if you're, if you're trying to get treatment and you have all the consequences of chemotherapy, the idea of being in a car for eight, nine, ten hours, that's just kind of uh, mind boggling. But when, it, when you start talking about issues like screening, that gets complicated, too, because um, a simple mammogram becomes, a, you know, a, a two or three day event. Right. Yes, absolutely. And think about if you want to get a mammogram, but you're also a mother or a grandmother and you're taking care in addition of the farm and, and you have to travel to get that mammogram. So what we did find in surveys, the first surveys of our frontier populations that people really care about cancer care and cancer prevention, and they want to make this a priority. But what we try to do is also bring our opportunities for care 
to them. And so, for example, we have a mobile mammography bus and that has traveled already thousands of miles to bring mammography screening to our patients. And they've been to places where there's no services, no federally qualified health center, no other uh, care. And they've seen hundreds of patients, many of which who had their very first mammogram through this setting. So the good news is people want this. They understand the value of screening and prevention is, is there, or is there further education which needs to be accomplished? There, there's definitely valuing for prevention and care from what we have seen, but we just want to point out that those, you know, those groups of people, those populations in the Mountain West have not really been listened to very much. Um, they, many of the surveys that have been done have not really covered uh, those populations. We're just now understanding from a very first broad survey on health behavior, science communication, and healthcare, what, what they need and what they want. And we have also organized a Mountain West Summit. So there's a lot more that we really need to understand um, in order to, to best provide the services and help and connect. Well, it, you know, a, a lot of this too, it, when you're trying to identify such a remote population to understand, you know, it's difficult to do a focus group, put it that way. So how are you able to even uh, get that kind of data on what, they're, what they need? Well, we actually have many partners across the Mountain West, the Cancer Coalitions, the Federally Qualified Health Centers, and we did a survey with a Wyoming um, Institute. But it, the survey is just one piece of information. We absolutely do something we call focus groups where we bring people together and the objective is to listen and to learn from our side because often we make assumptions that are entirely wrong. And that has been also very successful with respect to HPV vaccination. We have done a lot of work on trying to elevate the HPV vaccination rates here in the Mountain West. HPV vaccinations, vaccinations in general, became so controversial in the midst of the pandemic. Are, are you able to um, get some good, solid science-based information to these, this population? Well, it's absolutely a dialogue, and it's a dialogue that has to be very respectful and caring. And one thing that everybody cares about is their kids. And so sharing with them what we can do to help their children to avoid having in the future cancer, but also maybe infertility because of sequelae of HPV um, complications. So I, I think we, we just, again, we have to listen to learn and then um, understand how can we best communicate. And yes, the national landscape has not helped, but um, we find that in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, especially with the healthcare providers, we make a big difference. So during the pandemic, we all learned uh, about uh, having a dialogue with our healthcare providers uh, electronically. And, uh, and that was you know, truly a silver lining out of the pandemic was the, everybody getting accustomed to this on both sides of the equation. What, how much are you leaning into that idea? And um, when you're talking about frontier populations, I imagine there are other complications, just simple bandwidth and technology and the ability to, to even do telehealth much be, must be limited. But I assume that's a key part of what you're doing. Absolutely. That's exactly what Huntsman Cancer Institute's mission is, to deliver this cancer-free frontier through transformation in the healthcare delivery. So we're doing a lot of research on how can we use telehealth and different other ways to, to engage and, and what we call is like bring care to people's homes. We have a program called Huntsman at Home, where we have continuous a care for our patients um, and avoid that they have to come to an emergency department um, for, for any complications. So this has been in rural Utah, for example, and uh, we just realized that there were like more than 50 situations where they normally would have been advised to come to an emergency department visit and they were able to stay at home through care that we were able to provide targeted in this setting through some nurses. Um, we also do a lot with like, you know, telehealth is critical right now. In, as you alluded to, in many situations, there is no bandwidth. So we have to work with that. And we work with like symptom assessments basically through the phone. Um, and that, that works quite well. And in addition, we use transformative new ways like artificial intelligence to just monitor what's reported in terms of those symptoms and identify patterns 
that enable us to then come in and prevent and say, oh, wait a minute, here's something going to happen that we have to step in for. So we're trying to be as innovative as possible and, and make this really a big part of our research activities. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty fascinated about the idea that artificial intelligence can help you with this. Can you be a little more specific about how it actually would be employed? Well, it has been successfully tested in predicting who will get an asthma attack. And so, um, and a brand wow, that's fascinating. And is that, is that uh, like akin to a large language model or is it pattern recognition? What, what, what's going on? It's pattern, really it's pattern recognition through electronic health records. And in this case, for us, we are using it. Um, and this is research, right? This is where we just are trying to go and evaluate this. But it's a partnership here at the university with some of our informaticians, AI specialists, and our um, Huntsman Cancer Institute Cancer Center members who work together to think about that. So it's pattern recognition of what data do we assess on our patients remotely. And that is happening and then will enable us to step in if we say, here is a, a red light coming on. So it's basically a way of using AI for triage of a lot of data. That's fascinating. I know AI is making a big impact on, you know, the ability for radiologists to look at images and, and, and it can see patterns and, and problems long before the human eye can pick them up. So this is akin to that where you can sort of get ahead of things way before a phone call would uh, give you any clue? Yes, exactly. That's one other opportunity. And I do honestly think that AI will give us so many opportunities. I know there are concerns that we have to sort out, but for remote care, for being able to help patients who are 500 miles or further away, it really will help us to um, to transmit images that can be seen, that can be reviewed very quickly as, as part of an initial um, process without even a person yet being there before the physician comes in the room and or virtually in the room. And that's, I think, is a huge potential for helping our rural and our frontier populations. It's uh, it's a huge challenge when you consider the amount of, you, you have a lot of turf, don't you? I, do you get a bit overwhelmed by it all? Well, we set out to do this because there's no other NCI designated cancer center in that region. There, This is really our our job, we call it the area we serve because we're passionate about it and we work on it in various domains, domains with many, many partnerships and it ranges from like the screening bus and, and research activities, for example, with Montana State University. Um, but it also means that we work with our politicians to overcome barriers that exist across border, state borders. Let's talk a little bit about Medicaid and its influence in all of this. It, it is um, expansion of Medicaid a key in your view? Absolutely. I mean, Medicaid is such a central mainstay of health care for many of these underserved populations. And um, it, it would help us a lot to provide better access to screening and to preventive services and, of course, to care if, if people had universal health coverage or at least Medicaid. And that goes back to your comment about the politicians. That's a message that we need to make clear to our political leaders that, that Medicaid is not so much an expense as it is an investment. Yes, and um, absolutely. And I have to say, we, we've spent time on the Hill visiting with senators from the five states, and it's been overall a great experience. They really are excited to hear that we care, that the NIH cares about this area, um, the new NIH directors from Wyoming, and so that, that people are listened to and that we're trying to make a difference. So we can, in this context of saying, we want to combat cancer, bring up Medicaid as one example. It's, it's difficult in your part of the world. This is, you're in the red states and, and the, these issues of Medicaid become very complicated, don't they? Yes, and I have to say, I'm not an expert on it, but I have to say that cancer is something that unifies across party lines. Um, Mr. Huntsman, who was our main philanthropist, worked on the Hill, and he said, I'm from the cancer party, and it doesn't matter whether we are red or blue. And every second man, every third woman will get cancer, whether they're Republican or Democrat. And so we, we work with everybody to improve the, the case. 
cancer is a bipartisan killer, isn't it? That's really absolutely. Right. It's a bipartisan killer. And maybe there's one thing I also want to highlight that um, has been important to us is to to educate by also providing access and opportunities to to the next generation that is growing up far away from opportunities that kids have to, who are living in, in cities. And so we have programs to bring them here to learn about what research is, what clinical care is to provide pathways for their careers. And we also work with them through programs that are interactive with colleagues in New York City. So they talk to to kids and teenagers who are coming from a very different background. So we really see that as our mission to advance a cancer-free frontier. A little different population density, huh? <laughs> different population, but now here's one thing. So um, think about a cancer patient in New York City will have similar challenges in coming to care if they are immunosuppressed, they don't want to use the subway, they cannot drive, and for them, telehealth or ability to have remote care is just as relevant and helpful. So what we learn here can be quite relevant for the rest of the nation. A different kind of canyon to travel through, for sure. All right. Nelly Yorick, who is uh, with the Huntsman Cancer uh, Institute in Salt Lake City. Uh, thank you for all the good things you're doing to uh, try to bridge that disparity gap that relates to distance and population density. Uh, very important work. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This is the National Cancer Prevention Workshop produced by Less Cancer. We're focusing this year on cancer prevention in rural America, screenings and health care for better outcomes. And people like Dr. Ulrich are doing just that. I'm Miles O'Brien. Thank you for watching.